Whether trade promotes growth used to be a very controversial question. It's less so today, I think, in large part because of the development of better empirical evidence. And that's what we're going to look at now. Here's a graph we showed earlier, which shows that GDP per capita in landlocked nations is much lower than in nations which have access to the coast. And indeed, if you take a look at the landlocked nations, among them are some of the poorest countries in the world, like Rwanda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. There's a few rich countries, uh, Austria and so forth, but they tend to be the exceptions. Being landlocked is bad for growth. Now, that's important because it tells us something about policy. Being landlocked is something like having high tariffs. It's a sort of a natural experiment in having high tariffs. Here's Henry George, a famous 19th century proponent of free trade. Echoing a statement I quoted earlier from Adam Smith, Henry George says, if to prevent trade were to stimulate industry and promote prosperity, then the natural protection to home industry offered by rugged mountain chains, by burning deserts, or by seas too wide and tempestuous for the frail bark of the early mariner, would have given us the first glimmerings of civilization and shown its most rapid growth. But, in fact, it is where trade could best be carried on that we find wealth first accumulating and civilization beginning. It is on accessible harbors, by navigable rivers, and much-traveled highways that we find cities arising and the arts and sciences developing. So Henry George is saying it's not places which have natural tariffs which have a lot of growth and wealth. It's places which have naturally low tariffs. So that tells us something about policy. Here, in fact, is a graph showing countries between 1965 and 2000, and they've been labeled according to their tariff barriers, their non-tariff barriers, uh, interventions with the exchange rate, and other factors determining how open they are, policy factors. And what it shows is that average GDP per capita in countries which were always closed during this time is much lower than in countries which were always open. And indeed, the more open the countries, the higher was GDP per capita. So this is a equivalent to our uh, our uh, natural tariff barriers, our mountain ranges, also showing the same relationship with uh, tariff barriers, with our policy choices. More open economies tend to have higher GDP per capita. Now, these kind of results have been questioned because they don't control for other factors. Maybe there's something different about open economies, uh, and it's not due to trade, but due to something else, which makes them have high GDP per capita. So let's take another look at a different approach to this problem. Here from a paper by Vagzia and Welch is a graph showing growth rates before and after major changes in trade liberalization. These has taken over 50 years or so from many different countries over different time periods. And what you see is that uh, after liberalization, you see a much higher growth rate, in fact, 1.5 percentage points higher than before liberalization. Also notice, by the way, that liberalization is often preceded by a number of bad years. So crises is often what it takes to generate reform. But when you do get reform, you get a big increase in growth rates. That's really a, quite a stunning increase, a 1.5 percentage point increase in growth rates after major increases in liberalization is a really important change. James Fyra, another economist, has looked at the influence of trade through the use of a great natural experiment, the closing of the Suez Canal. So because of the Six-Day War between Israel and Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, Egypt very quickly closed the Suez Canal in 1967. It was closed for eight years until 1975. And in fact, Egypt closed the canal down so quickly that 15 cargo ships were actually trapped within the canal for eight years. Amazing. Now, the Suez Canal greatly reduced the distance between some pairs of countries, but had little or no effect on other pairs of countries who had access to either a trade route which is at least as good as the Suez Canal or, in fact, which was better than the Suez Canal. So what FIRA does is he looks at what happens to trade and what happens to income in those countries 
those pairs of countries which were most affected by the closing down of the Suez Canal. So another way of thinking about this is that the closing of the Suez Canal was like an exogenous increase, like a random increase in tariff barriers. It was as if you, it was if you picked from a handful of countries and you said randomly, okay, you guys are going to have much larger tariff barriers for the next eight years. Let's look at what happens in your countries. So it's a natural experiment in raising tariff barriers because increasing the distance which ships had to travel is really the same as raising those tariff barriers. So what FireWire finds, indeed, is that the closing of the Suez Canal had a big effect, reducing trade in some countries. And in those countries where it had the biggest effect, you also saw very significant decreases in income. It's a very nice natural experiment showing that decreases in trade decrease income. Perhaps the most important piece of evidence, which has convinced most economists that trade is good for developing countries, comes from China and from India. So China was a terribly poor country in 1978, which is when they opened up to foreign trade. And the rest, as they say, is history. Since that time, China has been growing at about a rate of 10% per year, absolutely unprecedented uh, for about 30 years now, totally revolutionizing China and the world. Now, a lot of other things, it is true, were going on in 1978. Mao was dead. The improved property rights, particularly in agriculture, and they began to free up their economy on many different margins. Nevertheless, it's clear that without trade, China would not have been able to grow nearly as much as it has. The story is also quite similar for India, beginning a little bit later in 1991 with the liberalization of trade. And again, after that, growing at a rate of about 6% per year. Tremendous, tremendous growth for a country which was just simply not used to growth at anywhere near that levels. What's also interesting is that China has traded goods, and India, speaking broadly, has traded services. So these countries, very different countries, one an authoritarian regime, the other basically a democracy in a developing country, despite these differences, both these countries have managed to benefit tremendously from trade. And these countries are important because there's over two and a half billion people or so between them. So only two examples, but very, very important examples of the power of trade. Recent empirical evidence has also taught us more about the sources of growth from trade. Surprisingly, it's not just from comparative advantage. So think about Portugal. In the comparative advantage theory, Portugal benefits from trade by specializing in wine production and by producing less cloth. But what we're finding is that countries which open up to trade, both their cloth industry and their wine industry become more efficient and more productive. So competition here is a spur to efficiency, that is, it pushes prices closer to marginal cost, but it also tells firms you'd better keep up with the cutting edge. You'd better be productive. You cannot sit back and laze around and expect to have a market uh, which can't be taken away from you. Because we now have international competition, every company has got to be on its toes. So what happens is that efficiency and productivity increase in both the cloth and the wine industry, and you get uh, a shift from the less efficient producers, the less productive producers, to the more productive producers within the industry. Market size here is another important variable because the larger the market is, the greater the incentive to invest in uh, improving productivity and research and development. So if a country enters into a free trade agreement, it now has a much larger potential market for its exports. Those exporting firms have a much greater incentive to invest in new products, in new ideas, in R&D, which is going to pay off with a much larger market. Investment also increases. I'm going to come back and talk more about that in a minute. And you get inflows of new knowledge. And I'm also going to talk more about this. So let's talk a little bit more about investment. Here again is Vagsia and Welch, this time looking at investment before uh, liberalization, trade liberalization, and investment after liberalization. And what you can see is that there's a very large and market increase uh, 
in investment beginning with liberalization looks like a big permanent increase in investment. Now, there's a couple of reasons why this might be the case. It doesn't follow directly from comparative advantage, but it does follow with a couple of other assumptions. For example, as you enter into a free trade agreement, your exporters get a larger market to which to export. Therefore, it makes sense for them to invest in larger factories to build more productive capacity. That's one reason. Another, perhaps even more important reason, is that we have to think about free trade not simply in consumption goods, but also in investment goods. Free trade may be even more important in investment goods than in consumption goods. So what happens with free trade is that the price of investment goods falls. So with a lower price of investment goods, it now becomes cheaper to you know, import uh, Caterpillar trucks, for example, or to import computer equipment, or to import uh, a new technologies. Okay? As those import prices of investment goods falls, the amount of investment increases. And as we know from the SOLO model, that increases economic growth. Free trade also brings imports of knowledge, increases in knowledge. And this comes from some pretty obvious but pretty stunning ideas. So first of all, most growth is from ideas. Uh, it's true you can increase your capital stock, you can increase the quality of your labor. That's important. But overall, probably a majority of growth comes from increasing productivity, that is, from ideas. Now, here's the obvious but amazing fact. Most ideas come from other countries. So this is going to be true for most countries in the world. Okay, most countries in the world are simply too small to produce a lot of new ideas year after year after year. In fact, by one estimate, the innovations produced in just three countries, the United States, which is the dominant one, Germany and Japan, these three countries account for more than 50% of the growth in most of the other countries in the world, estimated on the OECD countries. So more than 50% of the growth in Australia and Canada and France, Norway, Spain, the United Kingdom, and so forth, comes from ideas which were produced in the United States, Germany, and Japan. So there are massive spillovers in new ideas. Now, the thing about new ideas is they're not simply in the air. Often new ideas come embodied in imports and in people. Now, how do you get those ideas into your country then? Well, you import the goods. So when you import high technology goods, that's like importing new ideas. You get to the benefit of those ideas in your country and by importing the goods, you begin to learn about those ideas as well. Same thing with foreign direct investment. So one of the most important facts of foreign direct investment is not simply that you're bringing in money or capital. It's that you're bringing in people who bring in ideas. And it's that it's in this way, through the import of goods and through the import of people, which new ideas diffuse throughout an economy and increase productivity in that economy. So eventually, what we want is everyone to be on the world cutting edge, everybody to benefit by ideas produced anywhere in the world. And we get there by increasing free trade. This tells us, by the way, that free trade is going to be especially important for small countries. The United States can go it alone. The United States is big enough so that it self-generates most of the ideas which it uses. But for most of the other countries in the world, they're too small to get the benefit of the ideas. They need and they want to import ideas from elsewhere in the world. And the way to do that is to have free trade, not just in ideas. It's not enough just to read the journals from other countries. You've got to import the goods, and that's how you get the ideas. Well, we've covered a lot today, and here are some further resources on geography, on trade liberalization and growth on distance, the Suez Canal effect, and so forth. See you next time.